uh, you know, it gives us great ple pleasure. I see that Dr. Christian Wagner has also joined us. Uh, you'll be happy to note that Colonel Gautam, who was with the Institute of Defense and Strategic Analysis for many years, Thank you. has joined us. And Professor Harun Rashid, our first Congo Bundu chair uh, at the South Asia Institute uh, in Heidelberg, has also joined us. And we have a large number of colleagues and students. Uh, so this is a good time to begin. And needless to say, uh, uh, Asim, this is, uh, you know, in our department, uh, uh, the legacy of Hamza Alavi is, oh, I can see Professor Kampikar having joined in from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi as well. Welcome, Indiva. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, we have, uh, you know, Hamza Alavi's legacy is something that we discuss a great deal in our department. So it's something that students have to know if they have to pass the oral exam before they write the thesis. Mm -hmm. However, what we lack is a more grounded understanding of where Pakistan has moved from, you know, that classic piece. Uh, which is abstracted in the title of, with the title of this lecture, Hamza Alavi's Overdeveloped Legacy. So Asim, I cannot tell you how important this lecture is, uh, coming from you as somebody who has perhaps uh, more than most people tried to wrestle with this legacy. Uh, moreover, you are not just a political scientist, you have a, a fairly historical bent, and you are also in many ways an active person in politics. Uh, so Asim Sajjad Akhtar is Associate Professor of Political Economy at the National Institute of Pakistan Studies, Kaide Azam University. Uh, he works on diverse subjects such as state theory, informality, colonial history, and social movements. He's published in very reputed journals, Third World Quarterly, Journal of Contemporary Asia, Journal of Peasant Studies and Critical Asian Studies. He's the author of three books, the Politics of Common Sense, State, Society, and Culture in Pakistan, Cambridge 2018. Uh, this is his most recent book. Uh, he also writes a syndicated column for, for the Pakistan newsletter, uh, newspaper, which I'm sure we are all aware of, The Dawn. Alongside his academic interests, Asim has been closely affiliated with political and social movements in Pakistan for more than two decades. So with that introduction, the floor is yours. Uh, Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Raul, and to all of the organizers um, uh, at the South Asia Institute, and uh, to all of those of you who are listening in or, or part of, of the discussion today, thank you for your time and for your interest. I hope this will, uh, will indeed um, meet your expectations, whatever thoughts I will share with you today, and I hope... Uh, uh, that that afterwards I'll also be able to benefit from from all of your questions and insights. Um, so let me just very um, briefly give you all a sense of what it is that drew me uh, to Hamza Alvi's work. Um, now almost two decades ago, when I was a graduate student, um, in a sense, um, when I first sort of got got to graduate school. What I posited in my in my sort of uh, synopsis for my doctoral work was that not much has changed um, from in Pakistan. Of course, as you know, the famous article and there's a series of articles, but sort of the seminal one to which Rahul is referring, and, and, and of course Alvi's work extends beyond just this one article. And I'll, I'll, I'll sample some of the themes that he talks about beyond this one. But the one that I think Raul was referring to was, was um, the one that was called The Overdeveloped Postcolonial State. An examination came out in New Left Review in November 1972. And um, the, the primary sort of empirical grounds for, for the theorization of the postcolonial state that, that Alvi uh, posited in that article was Pakistan. And... Bangladesh. Bangladesh, of course, um, had just come into existence. So uh, up to a few months before the publishing of that article, Bangladesh was, of course, East Pakistan. So in a sense, it was Pakistan that informed um, 
that that work and subsequent sort of engagements with that work uh you know sort of allowed it to uh to sort of to, well transported it beyond pakistan and to other post-colonial contexts colin lee's uh, john Saul uh famously took that idea sort of um interrogated the extent to which it could be extended to 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 africa or sub-saharan africa or post-colonial africa um, there were engagements with the overdeveloped formulation um, amongst, you know, Pakistani scholars, but also South Asian scholars more generally, uh, for the best part of of, of that period um, on into the 80s. Um, so, as, as Raul says, it was very influential. Um, and, and as I said, when I was a graduate student, I, you know, I started off from the assumption that what what Alvi is, is 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 putting forward in that article, sort of the assumptions in terms of the interest groups or the broad sort of conceptualization of, of power uh, in the post-colonial context appeared on the surface to be very much uh, intact um, in, in the 30 years, in my case, since Alvi had written that piece. Um, you know, my subsequent engagement with Alvi's work and then a whole host of other literatures um, in a sense, uh, demanded that I, I guess, sort of recalibrate um, and say, yes, um, Alvi's work is still very relevant, but it also requires some reformulation um, and some, in, in a sense, some questioning. And thus, that's sort of the, the title of this lecture, which is Hamza Alvi's Overdeveloped Legacy. And the reason for that is precisely that, as, as I said earlier, in the three decades when I, until the time that I started engaging with, with his theorization of the post-colonial state, very little had emerged, at least in the Pakistani context, um, that at least of a theoretical nature, there was some work of an empirical nature, but there was very little of a theoretical nature um, that had engaged with Alvi that at the very least uh, more substantively had perhaps challenged Alvi's theorization. Um, and so that's where this notion of an overdeveloped legacy comes from, that perhaps um, well beyond my engagements with it, um, it you know, potentially uh, sort of a, a, a challenge to the Alvian theorization could have come earlier. Now, I say that because I'd, my contention would be that in the Indian context, for instance, just to take an obvious um, comparison, um, a lot of uh, sort of theorization had taken place in the 90s, and the early 2000s, that in a sense had gone beyond the classic neo-Marxist dependencia sort of school, broadly speaking, um, theorizations of, of, of uh, post-colonial power relations or state more broadly, for instance, um, into in the late 90s, early 2000s, you'd already had this um, significant amount of literature uh, in in the Indian context about the everyday state, starting from Akhil Gupta's classic essay of 1995 about corruption and and sort of um, in a sense drawing from Philip Abrams had this very classic article in the Journal of Historical Sociology in 1988 um, where he had sort of in some ways posited this idea that we also have to take in a sense seriously the marxist critique of the state as an ideological in a sense obfuscation um and and sort of dis, dis, distinguish the state idea in philip abrams binary from the state as a set of material effects or or, or political practices and that spawned a whole not that particular essay but for me, there's a, there's a lineage between that essay and what became the everyday state theorizations of, of the post-colonial, in, in post-colonial India. More broadly, of course, post-colonial theory um, and questions of text and language uh, and, and post-structuralist theory more generally um, was, was in vogue um, at the time. And in a sense, um, the Alvian uh, or sort of similar neo-Marxist characterizations or theorizations had sort of gone out of vogue. Um, and I was just trying to grapple with the fact that all of this seemed to be 
um, acknowledged and, and part of what was taking place in new theorizations of politics and subjectivity in India, but nothing really similar. And in, not just in India, but, but for me, the, the obvious comparison was with India um, in, in terms of the Pakistani context. And, and nothing really similar had taken place in Pakistan as such. Um, and, and in fact, um, a volume which was, was published quite recently in 2019, um, in which Akbar Zaidi and Matthew McCartney, um, which is called uh, New Perspectives on Pakistan's Political Economy, um, sort of has brought together a range of now younger scholars um, who have written over the last eight to 10 years. And actually the subject was precisely this. Um, Hamza Alvi, his work, his theorizations, and the extent to which or the, the imperative of, of both using Alvi's work as, in a sense, a point of departure, um, but also thinking about what, what kinds of reformulations or challenges to his work may be in order. Um, so this is just a brief uh, beginnings um, of, of where I started engaging with, with Hamza Alvi. Um, and the reason why I said at the outset that it seemed like his characterization was still very accurate was because, of course, in Pakistan, the military bureaucratic oligarchy um, which Alvi sort of sort of put out there as in some ways the arbiter of power in the post-colonial context. And, and just very briefly, um, his challenge at the level of theory was to the classic Marxist theorization of the state um, in terms of a ruling class, which whether you had the, the Miliband version or the Pulansis version, and I hope all of this is familiar to those of you who are familiar with all of these uh, genealogies of Marxist theory, um, both of those versions were in a sense inadequate to capture the complexities of, of the post-colonial condition. And, and Alvi's classic essay posited that, in fact, in, in, in the post-colonial context, the state, um, uh, or at least power class and state power was fused in the form of three dominant classes, which he named, well, the landed class, what he called the indigenous bourgeoisie, and then a metropolitan bourgeoisie. And these three, in a sense, dominant classes were mediated uh, by what he called the military bureaucratic oligarchy. So the state, the institutions of state themselves then um, were, uh, you know, at the very least, um, in, in a, you know, involved in a nexus of power with those three dominant classes and, and perhaps, um, you know, in my reading, um, were the, was the arbiter, the, the institutions of the state were the arbiters. So of course, in 1999, uh, Pakistan was once again thrust into the throes of yet another long military dictatorship. So, you know, as a graduate student in the early 2000s, it seemed very much like the military bureaucratic oligarchy. And then broadly speaking, the landed class and, and a domestic or indigenous bourgeoisie and then, to, you know, in, and I'll come to this later on, the metropolitan bourgeoisie, in any case that this characterization was still quite accurate. In, in Pakistan's case, perhaps um, a, a slight variation on the theme was that in, in terms of the military bureaucratic oligarchy, uh, the military had increased its bargaining power within the oligarchy itself, vis-a-vis -vis the civilian apparatuses of the state, um, considerably in that in those three intervening three or four decades uh, since Alvi wrote. So, you know, on the surface, these interest groups were very coherent. They were still very dominant. Um, but ultimately, um, what I ended up positing um, in my reformulation of the Alvian thesis, uh, and that's what it was, I think I still, um, you know, after all this time, still would argue that um, Alvi still, still had most of most of the story right, and, and still does have most of the story right. Um, whether it be in Pakistan or beyond, the, the, the state apparatuses, and of course this, um, this harkens also to Pranab Bardhan's very seminal piece in the Indian context, which I believe um, was about a decade on from Albi, where the salaried sort of middle-class professional um, employed in the state services, um, played also a, a, a very prominent role in mediating between other propertied classes. 
um, in, in Bardhan's sort of classic formulation. So it's not as if Alvi um, was the only uh, one to articulate this, or in the African context, Jean-Francois Bayard wrote this very classic book called The Politics of the Belly, where against where again state institutions state functionaries um, were uh, you know uh, you know sub substantial arbiters of power within the social formation between sort of propertyed or dominant classes so all of this for me remains very accurate and, and i think very pertinent in thinking through what um what the structure of power in the contemporary post-colony looks like, or the Asian and African post-colony in particular, I won't suggest. Um, uh, while there is comparative purchase to be gained from thinking about Latin America, I personally cannot claim to have uh, done enough of that in my own work to be able to lay claims to that, to that region as well. So the Asian and African post-colony, or the South Asian and Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan African post-colony, even more specifically, um, but what I then proceeded to sort of, in a sense, add or amend, um, and this is where I think there was something about the Alvian thesis, which, which as I said earlier, was, was an overdeveloped legacy. Um, and this was literally about change um, within the social formation. Um, and in my understanding, the Alvian um, sort of structure of power was somewhat static. It was static both with regards to these dominant interest groups and the question of the composition of, of the state services or the, the oligarchy itself. And it was also static um, to take a Gramscian theme with regards to how hegemony was reproduced. So the fact of dominance or the fact of property, three propertied classes, domestic and metropolitan, and a very powerful state apparatus is is, is certainly, as I said, still a, a very, one of the very ac well, ac sort of accurate characterization of the structure of power. But for me, uh, it became more and more important to ask, why is this structure of power um, still intact? Um, how is it reproduced? Where is the story from below um, to, to draw on, you know, initially from the, the history from below that of course, uh, Eric Hobsbawm and E.P. Thompson inaugurated in the 50s and then subaltern studies took forward in the Indian context, in the post-colonial context. Where is the story from below? Um, how is this structure of power, um, as I said, reproduced? Um, where is ideology, broadly speaking, in this story? Um, why do these dominant classes um, retain so much power seven, eight, decades on, um, why is the state oligarchy or the military bureaucratic oligarchy um, still so, in a sense, entrenched? Um, and, and, and how does that... So, so two things to reiterate. Um, from within the dominant, the structure of power from above, how to make it temporally dynamic beyond what Alvi observed in, in, seven, in the 70s and 80s, what is going on within the structure of power from above, and, and how can we augment that theorization of power by adding a substantial component from below. And this, um, you know, partly was both cause and consequence. Um, this reformulation is both cause and consequence of empirics. Um, the fact of South Asia and Pakistan specifically um, having urbanized rapidly. And that I want to emphasize two major temporal moments. One would be the Green Revolution, starting off from the late 50s through this, you know, a decade or so later. Uh, and then in Pakistan's context, again, I won't suggest, I think there are some broad parallels, but uh, for the time being, I'll speak specifically about Pakistan. Um, major fl outflows of migration like the Gulf migrations in the 1970s, um, which also had, uh, you know, again, knock-on effects back into Pakistan via remittances. And, and, and broadly speaking, how an agrarian political economy um, was transformed, well, underwent processes of transformation via urbanization, via the expansion of non-agricultural occupations, even in rural areas, but also broadly 
the emergence of small towns and the emergence of, of, of the huge uh, metropolitan areas, Karachi, Lahore, et cetera, et cetera. And these sort of broad sociological sort of transformations generated new forms of politics, which I felt demanded theorization. Um, politics in Pakistan's case, like the rise of the religious right, the, the rise of what, um, following from Michael Kalecki's um, uh, seminal work, and then uh, there is a lot of work in the Indian context with uh, Prashant Jha and Barbara Harris White, um, what are what were called the intermediate classes, the growth of secondary and tertiary sectors of the agrarian economy, um, and the rise of the intermediate classes. Um, um, following from that literature, I wanted to try and incorporate the insights of that literature, uh, which was an empirical and also a theoretical literature and sort of integrate within this larger question of the structure of power broadly conceived. So that was sort of just to give you a sense of my own trajectory, in thinking about these questions and how and why, uh, you know, I um, ended up with, with a sort of a reformulation of the Aldean um, hypothesis or the Aldean sort of uh, uh, theoretical framework. And as I say, I think for me, it was an amendment, an addition, rather than a displacement. Um, I think the, uh, the, the fact of, um, of, of a particular set of dominant classes, um, of course, in and of themselves also, uh, you know, uh, move, if we move further along um, in the last, let's say, decade and a half, two decades with the financialization of South Asian economies, with, uh, with the explosion of, of uh, sort of, let's say, the, the, the swallowing up of entire tracts of what was agri agricultural land into, let's say, real estate or, or broadly speaking into um, wider processes of financialization. Um, one could argue that, you know, there could even be a further articulation of, of new dominant classes, um, financialized, globalized dominant classes, what I think in, in recent Theorizations have been called corporate capital, for instance, which uh, which have also generated a lot of debate within the Indian context. So, not to suggest that that dominant structure of power from above, um, there cannot be additions or amendments there as well. But for for me, it was more about adding what was completely missing. I thought in the original formulation, which was a story of ideology and reproduction of hegemony from below. And also broadly speaking, and, a, and sort of thinking about this, and this is this was the part that I thought, well, I would argue is, is for me, perhaps, uh, you know, to, to, to join all of the dots, um, was the role of the intermediate, or broadly speaking, the middle classes as sort of like, in a sense, a bridge um, in that reproduction of a structure of power, because the middle classes represent sort of a form of upward mobility, um, through which um, this dominant, otherwise exclusionary and often authoritarian um, polity um, is able to generate consent via, at least if nothing else, the promise of social mobility and indeed the fact of social mobility as well. Um, and that's what the intermediate class is represented. The son of a peasant becomes a petty commodity producer, becomes a transporter, becomes a small trader, um, and you know, works his way up the proverbial ladder, um, becomes involved in local politics, um, you know, joins a regional party or caste-based party, and in the Indian context, the Pakistani context, um, allies with some kind of identity-based politics like the religious right. For instance, in Pakistan, there is a very symbiotic relationship between the intermediate classes that emerge post green revolution and into the seventies and the religious right. Um, so in a sense, it was this bridge that allowed in my formulation an explanation, which said, okay, well, these dominant classes of the Alvian structure of power are still there, but they're there despite social change. They are there despite uh, many ruptures in the colonial political economy. This is not like, you know, the classic 70% of the economy is, is, is uh, centered around agriculture. 
um, you know, there has been a lot of diversification, there's urbanization, there's um, uh, limited industrialization, but certainly massive expansion of the service economy and that's 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 services sectors and that's that's consistent across all of south asia and of course much of sub-saharan africa as well so how is this structure of power from above sustained itself in the face of all of this social change um, and it was through the agency of the intermediate classes um, that i could you know, offer an explanation that was a viable explanation. Um, so that broadly speaking, now at the broad level of theory, um, this demands, uh, I, you know, we could articulate this in a different way by talking about capital and about state and about politics. So the, so the last part I'll come to which about politics. Um, and this, this was the part of my explanation, which also said, well, there was also for a time here, in the throes of urbanization and dis, you know, mass displacement from agriculture in the 50s and 60s, um, the late 60s threw up across, Pakistan, across most of the world, including Pakistan, including India, I'd say, including the rest of South Asia, um, an oppositional politics, the politics of the left, uh, the politics of the Naxalbari, the politics of um, students, workers, and peasants in Pakistan that overthrew the Ayub dictatorship. Uh, the politics of national liberation um, in the form of the Awami League, in Bangladesh. Um, and, and of course, this was a global political moment. So that's sort of the last part of my story, which is, well, this happened. Yet, um, at, in the 1970s, you see a restoration of class and state power. Um, so there was, a, there was a contestation of the Alvian nexus of landed power, of uh, the, the, both the indigenous and the metropolitan bourgeoisie from below, uh, largely through articulations of left or some kind of nationalist sort of articulations. Um, and this reflected certain ruptures in the colonial political economy. But it was through the agency of the intermediate classes in my narrative that, in a sense, state and class power or the dominant structure managed to in a sense, retain its stranglehold and, um, you know, articulate uh, a new sort of uh, volatile, uh, tenuous, but a new sort of um, hegemony um, from, broadly speaking, the middle, late 70s onwards. So that, um, you know, in a nutshell is, is sort of um, uh, the, the, what my work itself um, you know how it all came together you know, from where it started to to what i felt um were in a sense the the, the questions that or the like i said the points of departure in alvi's work that could also be a springboard to deepen or to go beyond in a sense alvi's work um and i haven't even spoken right now one could about all of alvi's other work uh, his work on imperialism um, his work on the salariat, uh, and the sort of he had a very materialist um, explanation for the Pakistan movement and the salaried classes. Um, he had a, a great body of work on the peasantry and rural political alignments and what he called bradri and patrilineal lineage in his, I think, initial uh, incarnation as an academic, as a graduate student. He, he, did, he did work... Um, he, he was an anthropologist, and he, that, that was what his, I think, dissertation was. So, I mean, the, his work is is remarkably diverse, um, in, a, in a sense, very much a, a polymath uh, in, in academic terms, bridging all sorts of disciplinary boundaries. Um, and what I've shared with you today is just my engagement with Alvi's work on that particular um, subject matter of, of his overdeveloped post-colonial state formation. And I'll just very briefly about the term overdeveloped. I, you know, with great respect to someone who, you know, is in a sense an intellectual mentor, because I think that's how I, I view Alvi's work as someone who has guided a lot of my own interests. But the overdeveloped sort of term, the concept is quite functionalist. You know, overdeveloped vis-a-vis -vis what? Um, now, on the one hand, it could mean overdeveloped in terms of the state apparatus having coercive and institutional power uh, 
far beyond um, what you know classic Marxist theorizations of the state, in which, as I said at the outset, there is a ruling class and the state sort of serves its interests. But when I read deeply, I found that, in a sense, um, whether it was explicit or not, Alvi's formulation also, or articulations also suggested overdeveloped state vis-a-vis -vis underdeveloped society. And I found that quite functionalist in a sense, and that's partly uh, just to go back to, to an earlier point, what I, I, want, I felt needed to be, there needed to be a corrective to, that society was not underdeveloped or overdeveloped vis-a-vis -vis the state, it was in the throes of change. This was, of course, a colonized society, in, in, and of course, in Pakistan's case, um, as opposed to post-independence India's case, um, um, you know, there was no Madras or Bombay or Calcutta in Pakistan. There was no, um, you know, Congress, which in a sense, at least partially catered uh, or, or, or represented the interests of an emergent bourgeoisie that wanted to be free of the clutches of, of imperialism to develop itself. There was no national bourgeoisie. Um, so Pakistani society was its own, that the social formation was its own sort of um, demanded its own interrogation. And I felt that that interrogation should not start from the premise of being underdeveloped vis-a-vis any sort of prototype per se. Um, and I think that that um, sort of informed, uh, as I said, the, the emphasis on sort of the, the, the empirics guiding the theorization. The empirics told me that there was substantial social mobility, that there was a lot of urbanization, that there was, um, as I said, the, the rise uh, of very much new um, political and economic um, agents in the form of these intermediate classes. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the overdeveloped, uh, I think it, for me, it, it, to be to limit it to the idea or to the notion of a state apparatus, and of course, in Pakistan's case, a military, um, a national security apparatus that is far more, uh, that garners far more resources, has far more coercive power, far more ideological power than any other apparatus of the state or let's say uh, political representative institutions like the parliament uh, or let's say the, you know, the other segments of the bourgeoisie, uh, you know, the private sector broadly speaking being crowded out by military capital. That I think is, is a conceptualization of overdevelopedness that still could hold ground. But as, of, as with regards to an overdeveloped state vis-a-vis -vis an underdeveloped society, insofar, I'm not saying that Albi would actually posit it in this way, but I did feel, feel the need to offer, um, in a sense, a corrective to the extent that that was even in, implied uh, in the Albian formulation. So, um, of course, there's lots more that I could get into. I think uh, my feeling is it would be good now um, for, for us to engage um, with one another if, if there are, uh, and I hope there will be, um, questions and comments and, and uh, correctives to what I'm offering. Um, so if, if with your permission, Rahul, I will stop there and, and maybe we can take it on as a conversation from here on. Sure, sure. I think uh, you kind of both praised and problematized Alavi and uh, uh, some of us have uh, only a secondary literature knowledge of Pakistan. Uh, so I'm sure there will be a lot of curiosity. Uh, so please, uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes, uh, Christian, please. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, um, always the same kind of challenge um, in these days. So um, thank you very much, Asim, for your wonderful presentation. I have two questions um, regarding Pakistan. Just wait a moment. So here, um, the first one, there's a lot of debate in Pakistan about, let's say, the feudal forces, the feudal land, land, landlords, especially Punjab and Singh. So my question, and this, of course, it's also controversial 
So my question would be, how would you consider their strengths today? Are they still so important, especially in rural areas, or have they also lost, let's say, towards these new social forces? Second point, I'm, I'm wondering in how far do these social, these social transformations that you've put forward, have they also reflected in the, let's say, in the party system? When you compare it to India, you saw in India, you saw the trend towards regional parties in the 1990s. There were times when you had, when the percentage for regional parties was larger than for national parties, okay? Of at least for the two major ones. So I wonder in how far do you see a sim or do you see, let's say, this kind of trends, the societal transformation translating into the party system? Of course, you can make the point, well, the PTI is a new party, but I mean, the PTI can also be seen as a party. Is it really a party of new social forces? Or is PTI, let's say, the remnants of traditional parties, of frustrated members from other parties under a new dynasty or new leadership? So in how far, let's say, do have these um, societal changes really translated into the party structure, changing, let's say, the political game? Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, I think good, very important questions helps me to, to in a sense, develop further um, some of the stuff that I've shared with you at the outset. So the first thing about the feudal, now, it's, it's very interesting, this term itself um, has come in for some debate within Pakistan. Uh, and this, again, takes us to Alvi, because Alvi, uh, in his work on what he called colonial capitalism, or the colonial mode of production himself, as early as 1975, um, had challenged the notion that we could call um, the, the system of land tenure in British India uh, feudal. Um, and of course, then this goes back all the way to Ifan Habib's work and you know his classic article, The Potentialities of Capitalist Agriculture in Mughal India. And so the term itself or the conceptualization of feudal and feudalism itself as a long lineage in, and of course this colonial mode of production debate um, had ramifications in India as well. So there's a lot of debate in the mid seventies around it. Um, more recently in Pakistan, uh, most notably um, Akbar Zedi um, has definitively argued for uh, the fact that large land holdings should not be conflated with a feudal mode of production. Um, so this is just an aside to say that this itself is a debate um, on its own. What I heard you asking was less about the term feudal and more about large landed power and to the extent that it is still intact. Um, and one of the persons in the work that I've enjoyed reading in recent times that I would, I would point you to is, is Nicholas Martin, um, who's based out of Zurich, um, who, who did his dissertation on precisely this question, landed power. Um, and his argument was an interesting one, which there's, a, so there's two sort of debates here. One is that urbanization, more generally, the decline of agriculture has, in a sense, eroded the power of big landed families. Um, and that is sort of a more, I'd say, um, definitive and a, and a quite bold argument, which landed power is present, but is considerably less important than it was, let's say, 70 years ago at, at the time of partition. Nick Martin's work is a slight departure from that. He argues that new forms of landed power have actually displaced the original um, aristocratic families that were perhaps enfranchised by the British. Um, and that... So, for instance, um, his, his fieldwork is in the Pakistani, the Punjabi district of Sargoda. And his argument is that what ends up happening is that perhaps, let's say, an intermediate class faction of the kind that I was talking about, someone who generated wealth through sort of, you know, maybe transport or trade, um, and then chose to go back into the village, buy land, and in some ways become a new landlord. Um, without, let's say, the same caste or lineages that were traditionally powerful, but on the basis of new, so, new, new found sources of wealth, uh, 
um, which I've also, in a sense, hearkened to, right? When I say, let's say an, a low caste person migrates abro abroad to Saudi Arabia in the 70s, once upon a time occupied a low social status, comes back with a bunch of dirhams and, you know, moves to the next village, buys a bunch of land. And in Pakistan, this has happened. We, we don't talk about caste in Pakistan, like, of course, in India. But caste is very much a real reality in Pakistani, especially in, in rural politics as well. And so the Musalli, broadly speaking, the untouchable in Punjabi villages, changes his name to Muslim Sheikh, has generated a lot of wealth from Dubai, and now um, actually is, is sort of really is up to their social status. Um, so... That's to say that land is still an important source of wealth, of, of power. There's no two ways about it. Um, do the old established families from back in the day, of course, there's been intergenerational uh, transfers as well. So, you know, one father had five sons who had 15 grandsons. So there's also some of that that's happened. But there are, especially in Sin and what we call the Siraiki belt of South Punjab, there are still families that hold tens of thousands of acres with a direct lineage to the colonial period. And some of them are what we call peers, um, you know, people, Sufi saints with religious, um, and sort of a, a sort of a role as religious patrons as well, saints. And, and they have, they are the, uh, what we call the Gadi Nishins, the, the, the spiritual heirs of, 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 um, of saints and so on and so forth. So there is certainly, I would say, the answer to that is landed power is still significant. There are new sort of in some ways landed elites also that have emerged. And of course, now with financialization and real estate, like probably the biggest sources of landed power is like these big owners of gated land, uh, gated housing schemes in which of course the military again stands out with these huge defense housing authorities where they, they have literally millions of acres in their control. So it's a bit of new and old. Um, I don't think the sources of influence are the same, you know, where that's that old classic idea of a landlord with a bunch of dependents who are sharecroppers. So even land tenure arrangements have changed. Uh, sharecropping has largely been displaced in many cases, not always, by wage tenancy annual contracts, more seasonal labor arrangements, rather than perennial, you know, generation after generation, the same family uh, is tilling the same land. So, you know, it's a bit of a, of a mixed story, um, but I'm certainly not of the opinion that landed power is no longer substantial in Pakistan. It still is, um, and it's impossible. And if you look at the assemblies, for instance, the National Assembly, I think the last election, um, still about 35 to 40%. Um, of, 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 you know, of people with seats in the National Assembly were those with lineages uh, to colonial land settlements. So certainly uh, I wouldn't say that, that landed powers is displaced. I would say it has been, it is now, there is now substantially more competition from other segments. You, so for instance, Nawaz Sharif is a great example, right? A three-time prime minister has no real... Um, rootedness in some kind of uh, in, in rural Pakistan is a small time industrialist um, who was disenfranchised in the 1970s when the left of center Pakistan People's Party was in power. His industries were nationalized and then became the blue eyed boy of, of Ziaul Haq who brought him into power, made him finance minister, made him chief minister of Punjab, and then he became, and, and his, his sources of wealth are largely commerce, trade, and, and some kind of manufacturing. So I'd say there's been an additional, sort of a, a, a greater role of more influence of what Hamza Alvi would call um, the indigenous bourgeoisie within that three-pronged dominant class framework. Um, but landed power is still very much there. Uh, it's certainly not been displaced. The second question, um, uh, again, of course, in, in, in a similar yet different way to India, yes. Uh, social change, urbanization, mobility, the rise again of the intermediate classes. I mentioned very briefly, uh, I can speak more about it now, uh, particularly with the rise of the religious right. Um, there is a very... Uh, often with the with religious 
with the right in Pakistan, we, it's overdetermined by security lenses and the terrorism studies. We neglect, you know, the social class dimensions of these organizations. Um, so if one of the better studies that first articulated this link between the trading commercial classes and the right was a study in, in modern Asian studies in 1999 by Qasim Zaman. And he explained the rise of what, the Sipa Sahaba, or the Lashkare Jangli, which was one of the first very militant Sunni sectarian organizations, anti-Shia organizations in Pakistan, um, and in, this, in the Punjabi town of Jhang. And his argument was that essentially Jhang was, again, a classic rural hinterland where big landed power also in some ways was articulated as the, as the prime force of, of, of uh, or the primary mode of articulation in, in mainstream politics in elections. And through the 80s, uh, a commercial class emerged, traders, transporters, uh, and they articulated their politics in the form of sectarian ideology. Um, but what it actually was, was a middle class that wanted uh, to have political power uh, consonant with its rising economic strength. Um, so, so the religious right is, of course, the big example. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that unlike the regional parties in India, or even caste-based um, political players in India, the religious right has never, uh, this is also a fact of Pakistani politics, never really made a major dent in uh, electoral, in the electoral realm. It, it has more of a, you know, a, a larger than life role in terms of agitation, as you see in Pakistan regularly. Um, more, most recently, famously with this Tariq el which in the space of four or five years, literally has emerged as a major agitational force. Um, but historically, the religious right, even though it does have often have support from these intermediate classes, um, has, has struggled to make a dent in the ballot. Now, that's got to do with some of our constituency-based sort of um, uh, lineages where many constituencies are not reflective of social change and urbanization, like the way the constituencies are created. Um, but there are some other examples of how middle class and social middle class politics has had a dent, has made a clear dent in, in the electoral realm. The biggest example would be the MQM in Karachi, the Muttahida Qaumi movement, um, which was a largely middle class, Urdu speaking, what we call Muhajir, identity based form of politics. Oscar Verkaik, the Dutch anthropologist, has written about the MQM at length. Um, and they, of course, dominated Karachi's electoral politics until quite recently, um, including during the Musharraf era. So there's different, and, and the MQM, mind you, is considered as, has a very secular sort of articulation. So it's right wing, but it's very secular right wing. And then there's a religious right, which has had some successes electorally, but, but not so many. Um, so that's an interesting sort of, I'd say, distinction from the Indian context. As regards the PTI, the PTI is, is a slightly different, I would argue, um, matter because A, it's much more recent. Um, so the PTI, uh, uh, yes, certainly has a lot of what we call in Pakistan turncoats, you know, people, electables who've shifted from other parties like the Muslim League or the People's Party. Um, but the PTI also has a very significant discursive component of younger, you know, sort of more tech savvy, you know, globalized um, young people who, who have really taken on the, 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 the narrative of, you know, the established clientelistic parties have to be now displaced and we need a new sort of a politics that is not patronage based and we need a politics about ideas and merit, so on and so forth. Um, so I, the PTI certainly demands interrogation, um, but in some ways my work, at least the, what I've discussed today, was dealing with a temporal frame into the 70s, 80s and 90s. And the PTI I think comes at a different juncture, more into the 2010s, um, which again, uh, certainly is, reflects social change but perhaps a different phase than what I was specifically speaking to.
thank uh, uh, thank you, uh, Asim, for these. There are two questions that I have. The first one is from uh, my graduate student and colleague, uh, Jay Shankar Prasad. Uh, thank you for the lecture. How does your engagement with Alavi's legacy sit with the Althusserian concept of ideological state apparatuses? What role do these play in Pakistan? And then there is another one, which is by a graduate student from the University of Warsaw, Simant Bharti. I have not heard anything about civil society engagement in Pakistan. So my question is, what is the role of civil society organization in social and political transformation in Pakistan? These yeah, the, the Althusser question is a, is a great question. <laughs> Althusser is a subject unto himself, of course. Uh, you know, without getting into the specific uh, debates in, in, in somewhat abstract Marxist theory, I mean, I mentioned Pulances, uh, who, of course, um, very much was, a, in a sense, carried on the Althusserian legacy. Um, so without getting into some of those uh, sort of asides or, 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 well, substantial theoretical debates, but, but without getting into them, uh, as I said earlier, my concern was with ideology, broadly speaking, or, or at least ideology, broadly speaking, mean, I, I would say more than ideology, the question of reproduction of power and consent um, and how that could be squared with a structure of power that um, was re appeared to be resilient. Um, so... What I wanted to do is, and in Pakistan's case, I guess, if we want to talk about ideological state apparatuses, it's hard to look beyond the national security apparatus, right? And Pakistan's sort of broad, never-ending, uh, in a sense, existential crisis, um, where, you know, it has, it has this perennial threat. Um, it's sort of the siege mentality. Um, and, and all... The ideological state apparatuses, or what Gramsci would call the terrain of, 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 of you know, hegemony, you know, media, schools, places of religious worship, workplace, even the family itself. Um, that ideology of, of national security being paramount um, has, uh, of course, uh, is one of the major explanatory factors for why the military, in particular, but you know, Hamza's, uh, Alvi's military bureaucratic oligarchy um, uh, has remained the arbiter of power. So uh, these, these, these matters are certainly directly linked. Um, Althusser's, of course, particular theorization of ideological state apparatuses, I did not um, choose to deploy. Um, I, I deployed, as I said, the, the theoretical architecture of Gramsci, who, of course, deals with similar themes, but does so more at the level of subjectivity. Um, and for Althusser, um, subjectivity or, or is, is, is perhaps less important um, than sort of the, the structure and its overdetermination. So um, there was no direct engagement with Althusser, but ideology, certainly, consent, certainly, um, how and why, um, patronage, um, you know, at, at, at the local level, um, uh, retained, or remained rather the, the sort of the dominant modus operandi in terms of, of, of politics. Um, why, as I said earlier, very briefly, why um, competing ideologies, ideologies of contestation, particularly on the left, um, until the 60s and early 70s were then once again displaced by more accommodationist um, worldviews or our ideologies. Um, patronage had a resurgence, state and class power were resurgent um, through the Ziaul Hakirs. And of course, in Pakistan's context, you know, this is not, I don't want to um, distract us because there's so much literature in Pakistan about civ civil military relations. And all of this inevitably brings us back to the military. Even now, I was talking earlier, the earlier question about land. It's impossible to get away from the fact that um, the, the military is also a big landlord now. So, I mean, inevitably you come back to that question of security and national security and undergirding so much of, of, of uh, pow you know, power at the macro level and at the micro level in Pakistan. Um, so in that sense, certainly there was an engagement. 
um, but not with Althusser per se. Um, the second question about civil society, look, uh, I wonder what perhaps the, the particular reference to civil society, if civil society, because civil society in a Gramscian or even a Marxian sort of broad sense um, is, is our various social forces. Um, civil society is not progressive or retrogressive by definition. Um, so, you know, the religious right, um, trading uh, associations, um, you know, these sorts of uh, associational groups, which have, as I said, become more and more influential or become accommodated into the structure of power, you know, as I said, dynamically from below um, and mediate the, 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 the property classes and the subordinate classes. That is partly Pakistan's civil society story. It's not certainly the only civil society story. There are there's another there are other civil society stories. There's society, civil society stories of, of of progressives. There's civil society stories of um, let's say the NGO phenomenon from the the, the, the post nineties after the Cold War. Um, there's uh, just to link to the to the last question. I'd say civil society in terms of a, uh, a swathe of, of relatively um, professionalized segments who have become part of, or who have in some ways uh, are, are both a, a cause and consequence of, of, the, of the story of neoliberal globalization in Pakistan. They are very much, uh, you know, and the narrative of corruption, um, you know, the Anna Hazare story, transported to Pakistan is uh, is the PTI in a sense. Um, so there are different civil society stories. Um, for me, civil society uh, as a conceptual framework doesn't imply any particular ideological bent. Um, you know, it is in civil society where in a sense, class and, and other and the struggle of ideas actually takes place. And so, you know what I shared with you earlier in the presentation was, of course, the fact that the 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 prime not the primary but the dominant story was one in which you know the religious right and the intermediate classes helped uh, in a sense um, uh, you know reproduce or at least restore class and state power after a period of ten or fifteen years from from the mid sixties to the late seventies where left wing ideology challenged both questions like this dominant ideology of national security and, and class power from, from below was challenged as well. Um, so I did focus on that, but that's not to say that that exhausts the civil society story. Um, and, and, and I thank you for sort of bringing that to, to everybody's attention. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, this is not uh, just a question, rather out of curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, I would like to thank you for your excellent uh, deliberations. How on or will you apply, uh, I mean, uh, Alvi's theory or thesis in respect of disintegration of Pakistan in 1940? 1971, or, or, if, or if, we, if we put it in other way, the relationship between the two wings, essentially known as internal communalism. So uh, how could one apply all these thesis in explaining the disintegration of Pakistan in 1971? Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 is, it's, it, in a sense, it's a great way to to just um, sort of reassert what I wanted to to make the point. The primary point was that the structure of power was not immune from challenge, and in the East Pakistani case, uh, very as you say, uh, very rightfully so, a case of basically internal colonialism where raw materials from you know, uh, a captive, so to speak, hinterland, um, the surplus is generated from those raw materials support industrialization in the, in, in, in the other wing of the country. Um, and that generated mass nationalist sentiment, you know, what became Bengali nationalism. Um, and, you know, it's not that Ali was not concerned with these matters. 
he wrote about these matters. Um, there is even in that classic piece, which was, as I said, it was Pakistan and Bangladesh. I suspect he wrote most of it while Bangladesh was still East Pakistan, but he did make mention of these facts in that story. Um, it just didn't come to inform the theoretical formulation broadly. So empirically, there are, there are lots of things that Alvi was writing where he's making mention of dynamism, of social change, of contest, contestation. But the overdeveloped post-colonial state seemed still was, in terms of the theory unto itself, was almost like a closed box. Um, and it did not, it did not incorporate, um, I mean, you can have a theory that posits a very resilient and dominant structure of power, whilst also, um, you know, generating consent. The consent part of the story was absent. Um, and of course, East Pakistan showed that, you know, uh, there wasn't sufficient consent. Um, and ultimately, uh, as you, as well, some of you will know, and it's always worth emphasizing, the only instance of a modern nation state where a majority population has seceded from a minority. That's that's unprecedented and highly unlikely that it'll ever happen again. Um, so that is a it's, a, it's a mass failure of, uh, of, of to generate consent, certainly. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that, that Alvi, um, within the framework of the theory as, as it was originally constructed, mind you, you know, he takes the overdeveloped formulation and he deploys it in subsequent essays all the way into the early 90s. Alvi passed away in 2003. So in the early 90s, he's still talking about the overdeveloped state. And in those formulations, he's mentioning new actors. So there's, he talks about what I would call the intermediate classes in one essay in 1989. He actually calls it the bazaar bourgeoisie. Um, he has some small paragraphs on the religious clergy. So he's obviously acknowledging that there are social forces that weren't part of his original formulation. Um, but the formulation broadly, he didn't ever sort of in a sense um, rewrite it to accommodate. Um, and, and in the case of East Pakistan and that nationalist movement, um, it, it didn't. So I don't think he could explain it with some of his other essays on salaried classes and nationalism, but I don't think the overdeveloped post-colonial state theory would have been able to explain East Pakistan. But, uh, well, this is my... I think it explained West Pakistan and yeah. not East Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. I, I, got, I, got, I got it. But uh, should we then think uh, uh, in terms of uh, all these uh, thesis or theory that since Pakistan became an overdeveloped civil military bureaucratic oligarchy, which did not represent or did not have any representation from East Bengal or East Pakistan. So they developed it, 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 this, it, this kind of a state that developed essentially based on the Western wing also, on, mm -hmm. also played a contributory role to the disintegration of Pakistan. Had there been competitive democracy, say liberal democracy, and participate, political participation from the Bengalis, suppose, then uh, at least uh, the state uh, would have endured for some time more. But because of the overdeveloped nature and character of the state based on Western wing of Pakistan, I think that also uh, made a great contribution to the disintegration of Pakistan in Nazi law. So the, from that point of view, Alvi's theory is very much relevant uh, the, to, to understand the uh, disindication of Pakistan. Don't you think so? No, no, certainly. I mean, look, it, it, we, there's no election for 23 years. Yes. And the reason why there's no election for 23 years is, is as you rightfully say, because the military bureaucratic oligarchy uh, is... Based on... Is frankly, is frankly frightened by the prospect that universal suffrage will force it to give power, or at least share power, uh, with East Pakistani chalo, even elites, let's say, let alone the people. Um, so there's no two ways about this. Uh, so in a sense, yes, you're right. It does explain East Pakistan secession in an indirect way. Um, but you know, like I said, my, 
my, you know, the, and then of course, this is, this is the benefit of hindsight. One can choose to do so in a more explicit way, which is all I, I tried to do uh, rather than leave it implicit yeah. as a, as a well, story I, to be inferred. Exactly. Yeah. The point is, East Pakistani elites essentially belong to the Muslim League, PDP, and some Islamic party. They co cooperated and collaborated with the uh, your uh, uh, I mean West Pakistani ruling oligarchy. They collaborated, but they did not have any mass mass support. That was behind Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur You see, so that elite collaboration with the Pakistani ruling oligarchy did not did not help or did not work. Yeah. Just just so, very briefly. I think even, uh, Rahul, very briefly, I'll just make this point. I think even if the military and bureaucratic oligarchy had more representation from East Pakistan, that would still have been some kind of buffer. But there was no Bengali general. There was no Bengali 22-grade federal secretary. And that, you know, yeah. So, so that, you know, so it's just one thing after another, really, right? So there's even no attempt to generate some kind of legitimacy. Uh, so even within the oligarchy, let alone democracy, so yeah, I, I fully agree that there it was a it was a to use Ranajit Guha's phrase, it was a dominance without hegemony at all. Like there, there was no hegemony, hegemonic aspect was thoroughly uh, conspicuous by its absence. Yes, and I think the bureaucratic military oligarchy idea is can be traced to a very interesting piece by Jafrilo where he says that. Uh, the fact that Bengal was a more normal state, which had undergone, you know, normal democratic practices under colonial rule, whereas Punjab and the Northwest frontier were really far more strategic assets, where, you know, you know that this could be a way to derive, you know, why the bureaucratic military oligarchy through the colonial inheritance became so important. And and contra contrast that with the fact that you had ethno-linguistic diversity where Bengalis were actually more populous than uh, the rest of the ethnic groups. So yep. I, think, I think you are absolutely right in saying that the overdeveloped states worked for West Pakistan. And it yes. probably worked for West Pakistan also because of the nature of colonial in institutions that, uh, that, that existed in that, that part of Pakistan and those relationships. Yeah. Now there is a question from uh, you know, one of our master students, uh, Abdul Wahid, great lecture, land reforms was clientelism, therefore it failed. Do you think CAF was a tool to protect big landlords from land reform? The board of investment is protecting big landlords. Uh, the board of uh, investment is protecting big landlords from that. The Board of Investment is protecting big landlords. Uh, uh, do you think that, do you think uh, uh, big landlords and to implement land tenancy acts in Pakistan, do you think land still plays a vital role in the electoral process? Yeah, no, the first question that, that uh, I think um, was asked by Christian Wagner, this was sort of, that was the gist of it, right? The, the role of landed power. So land is still very important. Land is still influential. Again, not the subject of this particular body of work that, that we're talking about now around uh, Alvi, which I engaged with up till some years ago. But more recent work I've done is, is now forces us all to consider the way in which land is changing or the use of land and, and you know particularly as i said uh in suburban zones is increasingly large parts of the countryside are urbanized and, or become suburban um how land um is becoming part of these massive gated housing schemes or special export processing zones or um so whether it's the old idea of landed power as agricultural land with big landed um sort of families, which, which, as I said earlier, is still certainly partially true, or new forms of landed power, uh, in Pakistan's case, the military is a massive holder, a purveyor, uh, seller of land. 
um, or broadly speaking, private, big real estate moguls and, and uh, um, sort of companies. Um, it's all, uh, I think, to be thought about, to be theorized. Um, financialization, I mentioned very briefly earlier, broadly speaking, you know, the, this is about, of course, all of this story is about capitalism from the colonial period, how it develops, how it evolves, how it takes form, um, you know, through uh, and with social change. And, and now, you know, in the first two decades of the 21st century, we've seen it take uh, newer forms still, um, with 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 the financialization of the economy but even in that land remains uh, front and center of the story um so land reform i think would be a big political agenda i think it's telling that in pakistan up till the 19 late 1970s land reform was a big agenda and again that had to do with sort of the contesting contested forms of politics from below um with a mobilized peasantry and so on and so forth. Uh, interestingly, in 1989, uh, the federal Sharia court, um, which was a special sort of court that was formed by Ziaul Haq, ruled that land reforms are un-Islamic. I think this was part of the question. Um, so uh, that, of course, is a classic case of, of ideology being deployed um, to protect class interests, certainly. Um, and that ruling is still in effect. So it's interesting, we have two competing legal stipulations with regards to land reform. The last land reform legislation, which was passed by the National Assembly of Pakistan in 1977, is still in effect, which is that there's a ceiling on land, 150 acres of um, irrigated and 300 acres of non-irrigated land. That, that ceiling is actually still in effect. But another legal stipulation, which is the federal Sharia court, which supposedly applies to all matters that have some that pertain to matters of religion has ruled that any kind of land reform is un-Islamic because whoever is given land is, is, has a God-given right um, or you know, some version of that uh, um, um, explanation. Um, so, I mean, that tells you that, that land is still or would be if a political agenda or if, or if a set of you know, political agendas around land reform uh, were to reemerge wouldn't be a big issue. And that, that is evidenced by the fact that there is mass dispossession still on now in recent times in Pakistan, particularly for these big gated housing schemes, um, where whether it's in, inside the metropolitan area with squatter settlements, for instance, that are existing on what would be prime real estate, or slightly as, as, the, as the city you know, sprawls into rural areas and like the, the suburban zones, um, where agricultural land is being swallowed up. Um, there is a lot of dispossession, but there is no politics to represent the dispossessed, or at least nothing um, at, a, at, a, at a wide countrywide scale. So it would be, and, and, and in a sense, objectively is a big political and economic and social issue, um, but for the fact that um, you know, those, those, those articulations of politics are, are conspicuous by their absence. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one question from Mr. Prem Singh Gill. Yes, Mr. Gill. Hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yes. Okay. Hi, so thank you for your very instructive presentation. I have one specific question regarding when you mentioned about the caste in Pakistan, when you compare with India, that India, they do practice or they do have exposed very much a lot more than Pakistan. Because I also believe that in the Muslim community in India, they do have uh, uh, get exposed in terms of caste as well. Okay, so let me just uh, compare for the India and uh, you know the historical tra traject uh, trajectory of Ashrafia hegemony in the Sindh, in which is in the province of Pakistan, if I'm not wrong. So uh, could you please um, tell me about more about the in terms of the biopolitics of caste class, you know. Um, it, uh, that you can you can explain that in, in comparative in short if how how's it sure, different in sure. india well i mean different i simply meant that caste is of course a big signifier in indian politics and explicitly so you know we talked about regionalist parties but also caste-based parties um 
So that's the obvious uh, comparison. It, as a social phenomenon in terms of everyday life, my contention is that there's not a lot of distinction. Uh, it's just not called caste. It's not given that name. But let me give you a very prominent example. For instance, a community that I work with very closely, um, they are both often squatters, but they are often um, occupationally uh, ghettoized into a particular um, occupation, which is sweepers. And But they're all Christians. It's very interesting. So when the missionaries, the British missionaries came, they converted what were the very low caste untouchables um, who were ghettoized into the, 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 the occupations of clean, cleaning, right? Um, and till this day in Pakistan, big cities in Pakistan, all of the sweeping jobs are basically taken up by Christians. But actually, what you want to say is by low caste untouchables. They are Christians by virtue of the fact that they were low caste untouchables and were once converted, you know, let's say 150 years ago. And if you see the, the majority's behavior towards this population, um, so they are, they are, you know, in, in domestic service, they come and do the cleaning. In offices, they do the cleaning. And they generally, municipal agencies, uh, they are hired to do the cleaning of streets and drains and gutters. And the behavior is very ritualistic, like caste-like behavior. So people do not share, they do not shake hands or make physical contact with them. They do not share uh, eating utensils or drinking cups with them. Um, so, you know, that's just a very obvious example. Uh, in Sindh, uh, you have that uh, sort of, in some ways, uh, caste-like discrimination as well. Um, many, of, many of the lowest castes are Hindu, but there can also be non-Hindu Muslim low castes that are also teaching, you know, are the, in which with whom you can see forms of untouchability uh, being practiced. So, I mean, this is a question of empirical, uh, you know, which, which, which region you focus on, but, but these are just some examples of how, uh, you know, I would argue that caste is, is practiced in Pakistan today. I can see Professor Shapon Adnan. Thank coming. you. Uh, do you have a question, Professor Adnan? Wonderful. Uh, wonderful to see you after a long, long time. And I'm delighted that you were able to find us and we certainly share our link with you. Did you have a question to ask? Uh, um, Professor Mukherjee, thank you. Um, <laughs> good to see you after many years too. Um, I, I missed the first part of the talk by uh, Asim today. So I, I cannot really say that I have a prepared question. Uh, I am, uh, of course, I'm concerned about other aspects of the discussion. Uh, whether, mm -hmm. you, I mean, one thing which struck me mm -hmm. uh, uh, was the tension between the idea of internal colonialism mm -hmm. and overdeveloped state. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is somewhat stretching the idea of colonialism to dis use that in the context of relationship between East and West Pakistan. We need uh, more nuanced thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, the, while it is true that uh, the civil and military bureaucracy and the uh, also the major industrial wealth were very skewedly uh, distributed in favor of the West. It was not the case that there were not elements um, from former East Pakistan in these structures as well. They may not have been at the topmost levels, but they were certainly there. Um, and it is, I think uh, it is necessary to kind of uh, theorize this in a way which is more realistic. Uh, um, Asim said that uh, Alavi's theory would not be able to deal with the disintegration of Pakistan. Um, and it is possible that is, that, that is the case. But I think someone else 
uh, needs to, people who are working on this field need to be able to theorize the nature of the state in Pakistan in ways that accommodates an unequal relationship uh, in which there is co-option and there is collaboration by elements from East Pakistan. So it is not perhaps reducible to a, a black and white colonial relationship, but something much more nuanced. So that is one area that I would encourage all concerned to perhaps think about. Uh -huh. Great. Any responses? Hassan, uh, do you want to respond to this? No, I mean, I'm, 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 that, that sounds sort of up my own alley, really. It just, uh -huh. again, the question of, of accommodation, co-optation, consent. I do think that what happens in East Pakistan is a, is a spiral, um, which certainly is, is, is at the very least triggered by a military bureaucratic oligarchy, which is unwilling to countenance some form of um, popular representation. Um, but I, I agree at the same time, that's not to say that there is no um, either attempt or, or there wasn't at any stage in that 20, 25 years where East Pakistanis, uh, at least at the higher echelons or property uh, classes, or even, you know, to some extent within the bureaucracy. Um, but I think that it became acute after a certain point in time. I also think that there's, uh, I agree with the fact of, of thinking about this deep, at a deeper level about, again, at the level of society, because uh, similar, you know, processes of social change are taking place in East Pakistan as in West Pakistan. You know, that could be urbanization, that could be displacement from agriculture. And I think that, you know, where there's the Awami League and Mujib as a, who articulate nationalist sentiment, there's also class anxieties that are being articulated. You know, there's also Maulana Bhashani, for instance, um, who is a very popular peasant leader from East Pakistan. And that also contributes to this growing divide or this growing feeling of alienation. So there's certainly lots there. Uh, I know that uh, recently a very young sort of recent PhD, Lely Uddin, who's based at Queen Mary in London, has been doing a lot of work on Maulana Bashani and, you know, sort of, in a sense, from the Bangladeshi perspective also, um, you know, critically analyzing the question of, of Bangladesh and its own national liberation struggle and sort of deconstructing the idea of one Bengali nation, thinking about its own class cleavages within. So there's lots of, I think, work now that can help us, uh, you know, recalibrate a, a theory of, of Pakistan for its first 20, 25 years. And I, I, I agree that that is certainly a research agenda worth pursuing for those who, who have that, you know, who, who focus on that part of, of South Asia. Yeah, I think we have two last questions now. One is from our master's student, Shorodipto, and the other is from Mr. Mustafizur Rehman, also from Bangladesh, a graduate student working in the department. Shorodipto, please come in, and then Mia, you can come in, please. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just have a question regarding the history of uh, uh, communist parties in Pakistan. For example, uh, Say, for example, in India, uh, communist parties, at least at one point of time, even today in the southern state of Kerala and like maybe in Bihar, mm -hmm. have a potent presence. And India, say in Bengal, I mean, had the largest democratically elected communist government in the world, even in Tripura. And I mean, India could have had a communist prime minister in the mid-1990s. Uh, but yeah. for some reason, I mean, even though there's a lot of resistance and a lot of grassroots movements in Pakistan, there's no association. I mean, communist parties as such, if I'm not mistaken, did not flourish as well uh, the way they did in India. Uh, they're on the win now, but in India, they did flourish and they are still very potent in certain parts. Why is it that resistance mm -hmm. in Pakistan never takes the banner of, I mean, communism outrightly? Is there an explanation for that? Uh, just yeah, your thoughts on this. Yeah, and the last question, I yeah. think we can take. Oh, okay. And then... Sure, yes, sure, yeah. by all means. Uh, great presentation, Professor uh, uh, Asim Khan. Um, I am referring a literature which has been uh, published in 1980s by uh, 
uh, former vice chancellor of Dhaka University, Imajuddin Ahmed, where he uh, actually his it was it was based on his PhD uh, thesis, and in his thesis he tried to uh, define Bangladeshi state, obviously based on again Hamza Alavi's thesis, where uh, uh, Professor Ahmed uh, tried to argue that. Bangladeshi state was more lenient towards uh, Max Weberian uh, state. Um, uh, so as we know that um, the state as the interpretation, interpretation of the state by Karl Marx or Lenin is that it is the outcome of um, class struggle or the seizure of state power by the uh, proletarians. On the other hand, uh, Weber thinks that modern state is not the product of capitalism, but it is the consequence of human necessity and innovation to give society a higher element of rationality and efficiency. So um, obviously uh, during 1980s, we, we still had military rule, but, but he argued that Bangladeshi state was differing from, from Pakistani um, state that has been uh, defined by Alavi. Uh, uh, so uh, would you reflect on this? Uh... Okay, um, let me come to that. I'll, I'll, if, if, if you may, I'll, I'll answer uh, um, the first question um, to start off with. Um, yeah, look, I think that um, or actually, let me go the other way around. Let me let me do the second question because now that's on my mind. I I, I I I'm I'm constrained by, you know, just uh, knowledge and, and, and ex expertise to be able to speak too much about the the Bangladeshi uh, context. Uh, I do think that certainly uh, Praetorianism, uh, insofar as that is what. The, the term is often used to de depict Pakistan's polity, a Praetorian polity and a political army, um, and, and, and the fact of it having a larger than life role in society and, and, and politics, but also the economy. I, I, I obviously, uh, at least as you noted, in the first uh, perhaps decade or decade and a half of, of Bangladesh existence as an independent state, that 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 legacy was also felt in Bangladesh, right? Um, and I think that that's not surprising um, in a sense because you know those legacies don't disappear overnight. Not to mention the fact that the national liberation struggle accorded a lot of legitimacy to those military officers of the Pakistan Army that that in a sense led the resistance, right? So it's not surprising that they they continue to to have that legitimacy and and have. Um, in a sense, uh, you know, articulate that in the form of, in that sense, uh, actually taking power. With regards to, is there an explanation for, uh, you know, let's say Bangladesh's subsequent political trajectory, which um, would would sort of give more credence to a Weberian, in a sense, uh, interpretation of 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 um, you know state or the evolution of state or the polity. I don't know. I think that for me, there's a lot of broad similarities within, you know, for me, like if, if, I, if I understand Weber, in a sense, Weber is not necessarily different from Marx insofar as he also thinks about um, institutional forms, including the state, or as you say, legal, rational sort of forms of authority as being underpinned by some kind of social um, logic. So it's not as if legal, rational forms of authority are imposed from above and can take root from above. They still have to have some rootedness in, in the social formation. Um, so in that sense, do I think there's a different explanation for the articulation of state power or, or forms of statecraft in Bangladesh than in Pakistan or frankly, even in India? You know, for me, um, you know, if you look at everyday politics in India and Pakistan, and I would venture Bangladesh, they're very similar, right? There's a lot of uh, articulation of class power, caste power, gendered power, um, you know, um, and that is also uh, embodied by the state and state personnel. Um, and so, you know, patronage, for instance, as a modus operandi of everyday politics, that's also very um, sort of consistent uh, 
I don't think the fact of those uh, the, 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 that there are that many similarities that mean that 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 course that would necessarily may, you know that doesn't explain of course the differences that do exist the fact that Pakistan has had you know many cycles of military rule that it has a Praetorian army India doesn't um, Bangladesh has but presumably now is less likely to see an army that would ever jump into the fray again so I think there's 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 variation despite the fact that at the level of society there's a lot of you know similar trends so I I think that then it's just a matter of one's in a sense preferred source you know theoretical interpretation um, I I am I think I would have to read I I'm not familiar unfortunately with the particular um, PhD thesis that you're referring to but I'd really be interested in reading it because you know only then would I be able to really offer my perception on on how you know how much purchase analytical purchase there is but the fact of it being a barbarian interpretation doesn't would certainly not preclude um you know or, or to lead me to already say no i'm not inclined uh to 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 to, to sort of uh, give it credence i think it could do um and as i said even alvis and this is where we started this discussion today um that alvis uh, formulation um, also, you know, had something to be desired, right? It was also um, unable to answer some questions, um, unable to, to sort of be dynamic over the course of time and to accommodate social change, uh, both from above and from below. So, yeah, so beyond that, I would really uh, have to in, engage more directly with this particular um, um, argument to be able to answer your question. And then back to the, sorry, now I've lost my train of thought. What was the first question again? That was regarding, you know, communist politics in India and in Pakistan. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, I think in Pakistan's case, um, I think the demonization or criminalization of, of communist parties from a very early stage has a big part of it. Um, you know, in 1954, the communist party was banned in Pakistan. I think in India, the parallel would be Telangana in, in a sense, the, the almost mythical ultimatum that Nehru uh, poses to the communists. If you do Telangana again, I will crush you. But if you want to come into the parliamentary route, I will sort of allow, accord you that space. I mean, of course, that's a very simplistic version. But in Pakistan, there was no such option offered. Um, there was no option for parliamentary communism. Um, and of course, that also has something to do with Cold War politics. Um, you know, Pakistan was a was part of CETO and CENTO and US, U.S. security pacts and clearly chosen its side in, in the geopolitical wrangles of the 50s. And that meant that, like, um, you know, the Shah of Iran's, uh, you know, posture or, or let's say Turkey, um, it was one of those countries which was really an anti-communist, um, in a sense, frontline state, literally, that's... that's uh, that's, that's the role that it played. Um, so communist parties or the left more broadly were very heavily criminalized, at least in comparison to India. The other thing I think Pakistan has a much more serious issue or much more serious crisis of identity. Um, you know, we've been talking about East Pakistan. This is a country that had five provinces at the time of its creation and now has four. I mean, if you think about India, India had, what, 11, now has 28. I'm not sure exactly what the figures are, but, you know, something like that. Um, so identity and especially ethnic and national identity in Pakistan has retained, has been the primary mode of resistance. So various forms of nationalism it can be Pashtun nationalism. It can be Baloch nationalism. It was Bengali nationalism. Those Forms of nationalist assertion or ethnic nationalist assertion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a centralizing, um, you know, state, which of course also had a had a Punjabi uh, majority, um, were articulated with with the left or socialistic or or left wing ideologies, most notably with the National Awami Party uh, in the seventies. Um, so, there, which was an eclectic mix of of ethnic national groups and. The, the communist left. Um, and in fact, that's what the communists were left with because they were banned. They were, they often had to, 
form alliances and 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 operate in the form of united fronts rather than articulate themselves as a separate political entity so i think there's there's a there's a variety of factors state repression um cold war outpost um and yeah the the question of identity which meant that class ended up becoming in a sense or or let's say material deprivation or unevenness in development was often articulated in, in as as regional or provincial uh, uh forms of politics rather than some kind of universal identity of class great so i think we've had a real treat from you asim uh i think you both sort of protected the legacy of hamza alavi as well as argued that we have to move beyond that legacy at the same time you've also tried to think about cogitate about the structural roots of the status quo bias uh, which i think is an interesting proposition that you know maybe the intermediate classes are protecting this old structural uh, sort of power which has uh, fairly centrifugal forces that are consolidating themselves rather than but at the same time there is a kind of need to problematize hamza alavi i think uh, i think from what you suggested uh it still becomes very interesting and and i and i really like the fact that you compared bardhan to alavi in fact uh, in one published paper i have done that <laughs> and therefore try to argue that the bureaucratic military oligarchy and the dominant and proprietary classes are also two ways of thinking about the state yes. and i think uh, there is sort of a route to understanding i mean i i mean of course there is power but where does this power come from and how does it express itself i think is a very very important area where the distinction between power and ideas is often very difficult to make so i think we we go back with a fair number of questions and uh, to which i'm sure you and uh, many other scholars will address themselves and i'm also very pleased that we had uh, of course professor indi kamtekar didn't ask a question but as you know he's one of the leading historians of the partition and then we had two senior scholars from bangladesh who participated uh professor shopan adnan and uh, professor harun rashid and uh, dr christian wagner as you can see is still there uh so and a lot of my colleagues and students and all of us i think were really really enriched by the presentation as well as the discussion and we like to keep this ongoing so thank you very much and we will be I, ready Ra- rahul I, yeah, could i just also yeah thank you very yeah. much it's very kind of you to have me i'm very honored to have been able to be invited and also for all of the great engagements uh, and the questions that were asked i okay. thank you very much